minutes. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. And if you can remain standing for the reading of Scripture, that'd be a blessing to all of us. If you can open to the New Testament book of Galatians, the book of Galatians, and if you'd like to use one of the, uh, the Pew Bibles, you'll find that on page 972. This morning, we're going to start a new series in the book of Galatians. And this will just be a broad introduction. But I'd like to begin by reading verses 1 through 9. Galatians, page 972. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. This ends the reading of the word of the Lord. Let's pray one last time. Father God, we pray that in this new series that you would grant to us a deeper and clearer grasp of the gospel that you would deliver any Lord from this curse, that you would help us as a church to live under the truth of the gospel. And may you, Lord, use it for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Have a seat. Since the day that the risen Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul on that road to Damascus and gripped him, as we saw last week when Pastor Arns was here, yeah, arrested him, as it were, by his grace, and, and the Father sent Paul to preach Jesus among the Gentiles. Since that very day, Paul was a man on a mission, and his mission was to make Christ Jesus known to be the Messiah, to be the Lord and Savior among all the people groups, all the nations. And by the time Paul writes Galatians, a lot of that has happened. And God has begun to bless this mission, the Gentile mission. God opened many doors, and the gospel was bearing much fruit in Gentiles. That is to say, to be clear, non-Jewish people were pouring into the church. They were believing that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead and he was the Messiah. They were being grafted into the new people of God. That is, Jew and Gentile together under the new covenant, not the old covenant a people who are justified before God, set right before God by grace alone, through faith alone, on the merits of Christ alone. This, this people, this new people, were people who were not led by an outward code of the Mosaic law, but they had the law written on their hearts. They were people who were indwelt by God's own living spirit. It was a tremendous time, and these things were happening, but it wasn't happening all easily, per se. A lot of difficulties were being faced, and not everyone was excited by this development. Certainly those who remained true to Judaism weren't excited about it, but there were even those who were 
Jewish Christians, let me be clear again, Jews who claim to be believers in Jesus of Nazareth, who claim to have believed that he was raised from the dead and that he was the Messiah, but who still treasured all their Jewish distinctives. And it's understandable because for centuries, any Gentile who ever converted to Judaism was also expected to accept and maintain the outward badges of the, of the Mosaic Covenant, the Sabbath keeping, the dietary laws and circumcision, and so forth. In other words, for centuries, if you accepted uh, Judaism and you converted to Judaism as a Gentile, you were expected to live culturally as a Jew as well. And so now that the Messiah has come, why should it be any different for these Gentiles, you know? Why should they not have to also become Jews culturally? And so these, uh, with whom we call Judaizers, they objected to Paul's gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, uh, based on the doings, the merit of Christ alone. They were telling these Gentile converts that faith in Jesus was a necessary and good thing, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough if they were to expect to be set right before the living God. To be right with God, they must add to their faith circumcision, they must add to their faith the dietary laws and Sabbath festivals. In other words, they must also observe the law of Moses. And the way that uh, the late theologian John Stott put it, he said, they must let Moses complete what Jesus had begun. That was their point of view. In other words, believe in Jesus, yes, and obey Moses, you see. <laughs> it's a both and in their book, see. And Luke, who was the author of the book of Acts and who recorded this early history, he says in Acts chapter 15, some men came down from Judea uh, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So understand there. You, they connected, uh, accepting the Jewish badges and the law of God uh, as necessary to salvation. Uh, reading a little bit later, he says in verse 5, some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, but notice it says believers. These were believers in Christ. That's what they had said, and they were gathering there with other believers, and they say they were belonging to the party of Pharisees. They rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them, here it is, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And so this is what was taking place. Yeah. And everywhere that Paul went, eventually these Judaizers followed, and they dogged him. They went after him if they found him, but they certainly followed him from town to town. We know this way of thinking today as covenant legalism or covenant nomism. The word namas stands, it's a word that means law. Well, eventually, eventually what happened is that these Judaizers reached the district of southern Turkey today, as we call it, uh, which was known in the empire, Roman Empire, as Galatia, where Paul and Barnabas had planted the gospel. They started various churches in several cities, like Pisidian Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. And if you were here when we went through the book of Acts, you remember that these were cities in which Paul and Barnabas had gone together to plant these churches. And planting these churches was not a, was not a simple or easy thing. It had, planting some of these churches had come at great personal cost, and particularly to the apostle Paul. Uh, he suffered deeply to see these people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke records some of that in Acts 14. Listen to what happened. It says, uh, they had arrived at, at, to Lystra, and Paul was preaching there, and it says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, 
And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, these weren't the Jews who believed in Christ. These were just Jews in general. And they were following Paul. That's a different group here, right? And they stoned him, leaving him for dead outside the cities. But when the disciples gathered about him, what happened? He rose up, and what would he do? What would you do? It says he entered the city again. <laughs> he went right back in to the very town in which he had been stoned and persecuted. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and, and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That was quite a project. <laughs> Tremendous. It came at great personal cost to Paul, but he was willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. And so eventually what happened is news, news that, these, that the Judaizers uh, had arrived to these cities after Paul had planted those churches and that they were confusing these very churches that Paul shed blood for confusing them, distorting the gospel. Paul responded to this news by writing this letter. This letter that we know as the book of Galatians. And so I take this to be Paul's first letter. I know there's some who date it differently and say that he was writing to a different group, but this is how I understand it. If you wanted to <clears throat> to, to look into that further, you can go and read some of the more technical commentaries. I believe this, along with a lot of conservative scholars, to be Paul's first letter. It was written some 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how quickly all this was happening. It was written somewhere in around 48, 49 A.D., and it was written between the events of Acts 14 and Acts 15. Acts 14, I read from, which was what? The planting of those churches in that district known as Galatia. And then Acts 15 records that this matter of do, Jew, do, do Gentiles need to live as Jews in order to be saved? That question was finally brought to the, the leaders of the Jerusalem church. And that is recorded in Acts 15. And so I believe that this letter was written just before that event took place, because when they arrive uh, to Jerusalem and enter in that discussion and seek that counsel from uh, the, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, this is what took place. Acts 15, verse 5, I read this verse already. Some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rode up and rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And so they were thinking that. They were teaching that. And then it says, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. In other words, they needed to settle this once and for all. <laughs> and it says, after there had been much debate... <laughs> Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Cleanse their hearts by faith, given the Holy Spirit by faith. And he says, now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? <laughs> and he says, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And how were they saved? by faith alone. Then none of them had kept the law of Moses, right? And then it says, and all the assembly fell silent. And so the question was answered. 
in the early church once for all. And so as we read the letter of Galatians, Paul is writing on the cusp of going to Jerusalem. That meeting has not yet taken place, which is why there's no mention of it in the letter of Galatians. He's writing about the same issue, but he doesn't draw their attention, doesn't mention. And remember, I went to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and so there's no mention of that. Now, Paul is profoundly agitated uh, as he writes this letter. He's very angry when he writes. It's the strongest defense of the gospel in the New Testament. In chapter 6, verse 11, he says that he is writing with his own hand. Normally, Paul would have a menuances, a secretary who would write. And the reason they did that is these people were like scribes who were experts at, at writing really small, you know, on parchment. And Paul says in chapter 6, verse 11, see with what large letters, letters I'm writing to you with my own hand, you know. And some think he wrote the whole letter by himself, <laughs> burning as he went through it. And others say, no, I think he grabbed the pen from the secretary at this point and said, move out of my way. And he, and he wrote his final thoughts down. He calls the believers, he calls the believers of the churches, notice churches of Galatia, he calls them foolish in chapter 3, verse 1. He even goes so far as to say that he wishes those who confused them by teaching Teaching a circumcision would go all the way and emasculate themselves completely. Five, he says that in 512. These are strong words. And you heard me read in chapter 1 that anyone who says anything different than what he preached, he says, let him be accursed. What's he saying? Let them be, go to hell is what he's saying, to, to be frank with you. So Paul's angry. Paul is agitated as he writes these words. And why is it? It's because he loved them. He shed blood for these churches to come into existence. Chapter 4, 19, he speaks this way to him. He says, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He was in anguish when he went there in the first place. And here he is again in anguish until Christ is formed in you. He says, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, <laughs> for I am perplexed about you. I mean, this, I can't believe, I can't believe this is happening, you see. That's why he's so agitated because of what, what is at stake and, and how much he loved them. And what is at stake? What's at stake is the gospel. He says, let anybody who says anything different be accursed. And if the gospel's at stake, then salvation's at stake. And listen, the greatest question before any human being and God, before, a, before anyone, the greatest question is this. How can sinful human beings be made right before a holy God? That's it. That's the most important question. How can sinful human beings like me, like you, be set right, you know, before a holy God? Well, the answer to that question is the gospel, what God has done through Christ. And by this we can be assured, you see, but due to the pressure from these Judaizers, uh, some of these Galatians were beginning to think differently now. They're beginning to think differently about the gospel, and they were beginning to think differently about Paul. Maybe, I mean, who, who made him an apostle after all? And so Paul begins his letter instantaneously defending his apostleship. Listen to what I read it already. Listen, it says, Paul, an apostle, notice what he says, not from men nor through man. <laughs> No one in Jerusalem made me an apostle. No one drew straws and called me an apostle. <laughs> He says, I've been made an apostle. How? Through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. What's he alluding to? Uh, he met me on Damascus Road. I saw the risen Christ. And so he defends himself, and then he defends the gospel. Immediately, in verse 11, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. We're back to that again. Who taught me this gospel? Did somebody in Jerusalem? No. Christ raised from the dead. 
It was revealed to me by him. And so he has to immediately begin defending himself and the gospel. And as to their thinking differently about this, uh, differently about the gospel, he says, you know what that is? That's desertion. You're deserting God. I'm, I'm, I'm just astonished how quickly you are deserting the one, him, and turning to some other gospel, which is no gospel at all. And the word deserting is a military term that was used for traitors. Traitors and turncoats. He says, you're becoming traitors. This was such a radical change. And it came about so quickly, about a year and a half after Paul had been there twice, sweeping through and bleeding and planting the churches. We read it there and appointing elders in each of those churches. Within a year and a half, all this is beginning to happen. It's such a surprising thing. He says, he says, O foolish Galatians, chapter 3, verse 1, who has bewitched you? <laughs> it's like somebody cast a spell on you. <laughs> I, I, I was just there. He goes on and says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That's what I preached. Let me ask you, he says, let me ask you this. <laughs> Did you receive the Spirit? And he's presuming what? They received the Spirit. They're Christians. He said, Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? <laughs> Did you run out and get circumcised? Did you keep the Sabbath for a while? Uh, did you follow Moses and then you received the Spirit? He said, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? <laughs> and then he says, are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? <laughs> that is living in your own strength, right? Uh, according to rules and regulations. They were beginning to develop a new way of thinking about the gospel, a new way of thinking about Paul and his apostleship. And most importantly, they were beginning to develop a different understanding of justification. That's a very important word. This term will be used by Paul over and over in this letter to the Galatians, right? Justification, and we'll see it many times, but just let me say today, justification is a courtroom term. It's the language of a judge's verdict. And in, and in our American context, we're used to just simply thinking of a verdict either being guilty or not guilty. But as Paul uses the term, it means not guilty, but it means more than simply not guilty. As Paul uses this term, both here and in Romans, it embraces the notion not only of being not guilty, but uh, of being declared positively righteous. In other words, in Paul's writing, to be, to be called justified is, is more than the absence of guilt. It's the presence of righteousness. <laughs> and that righteousness is not ours, not merited by us. It is not the result of our own doing. It is the gift of God imputed to us. It is the righteousness of another. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. <laughs> As Luther would say, it's an alien righteousness. It's outside of us. <laughs> the righteousness right now, if you're a Christian, by which God views you and declares you his child and forgiven, justified, is not in you in the sense that it's the result of what you are doing or will do. That righteousness is at his right hand in heaven. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul goes on in here to say that this status, justification, comes about by faith alone. Not faith plus our doings, but faith in Christ and his doings. And then God declares us justified. And so for Paul, it's very essential to understand not only the meaning of the term, but to understand the basis of it. Christ alone. <laughs> who Jesus is and what he has done. Christ alone is the basis of our salvation and faith lays hold of him. He'll say in chapter 2, verse 16, he says, listen, we know that a person 
is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Implication alone, because it's not by works of the law. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. How many ways can I say this, says Paul? Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. How many times can I say this, says Paul? He says, for example, in chapter 3, verse 11, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Hmm. And so this is why Paul was, was livid. This is why Paul was agitated. The sufficiency of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us was being eclipsed to add... To, to Jesus is to subtract from Jesus. Subtract not only from his glory, but from the sufficiency of what he's done. And so a Jesus plus gospel is really a subtraction from Christ. And Paul will not have it because this is no gospel at all. This is not good news. Beloved, this, and this, is the, this is what was at stake, and isn't this, isn't this the glorious news? Think about this, beloved. The glorious news of the grace of God in the gospel, that when God sees us, he sees believers in Christ, and he sees us, therefore, as righteous. This is because the Father sent His Son into the world to endure what we deserve, His doings, and to be raised the third day from the dead on our behalf. And by our faith union with Him, by faith we are connected to Him, we are, He said, they're delivered from this present evil age. We are forgiven. We are justified. That's the judge's verdict. Justified. We are seen as perfectly righteous. That's the good news of the gospel. I hope every one of you in this room understands that and believes it. What Christ has done is the work of the Father, and it is sufficient for you to be assured that you are in the rights with God, forgiven, and when you die, you will not face his judgment or condemnation, but that you will enter into eternal life. Amen you see. And faith, you see, faith is what, you, what unites you to this person. He is the Savior. This is the great exchange of the gospel. What is the great exchange of the gospel? My sin, your sin, placed on him, his sacrifice, his payment, and his righteous life credited to us. That great exchange in which God alone gets the glory. And it's our pride that keeps us from coming to him. Certainly I must do something. Or the pride that keeps us from coming that says, how could I be that bad that the son of God would have to die? But that's the good news, beloved. It exalts God and it diminishes us. Huh? It humbles us. Paul would later write to the Christian, the Corinthian church. He would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a gift. Amen? See, I hope every one of you believes in him and understands that. Listen, this is going to be a very important series. It's, it's saturated in the gospel. And today, if you came into this room thinking, I haven't done good enough, or I'm, I'm ashamed of this or that, listen, salvation is a free gift of God based on the works of someone else, the Son of God. Humble yourself if you have yet to do so. Confess your need for him and believe what God has said, and you will be saved. Amen. And so this is the liberating message of the gospel.
It, it brings freedom to our conscience, freedom to our lives, freedom from the enslaving burden of the requirements of the law, which none of us could live up to, freedom from that, uh, that burden of seeking to be good enough in order to be loved by God, right? And Paul says in Galatians 5.1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, he says. To go back to Moses is going back to a, a yoke of slavery. This book, this book is explosive. <laughs> This book has power. It's been used by God throughout history to bring about revivals and, and awakenings. Uh, did not Paul say in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, the dunamis of God unto salvation for all who believe. Well, the book of Galatians is saturated with the gospel, and so God has used it over and over. Uh, at the time of the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther, that great foundational reformer, he said, I am wed to Galatians. <laughs> I think he says, I'm married to Galatians. He said, this is my Katie. That was the name of his wife. Now listen, that was a compliment both to Katie and to Galatians. <laughs> right? He says, I'm wed to Galatians. It was as a result of teaching through Galatians after he had studied Romans that Luther published his 95 Theses and nailed it on the door of the Wittenberg Church there, and that ignited the Protestant Reformation. You know, this book has power because it has the gospel. It has the power to set people free from wrong notions about God's love, God's compassion, God's mercy, wrong notions about how wide his arms are open to any who would humble themselves and trust in everything his son has done. It has the power to heal churches, again, who, Christians who find themselves going back to a yoke of slavery, you see. And so why should we study this book? For those very reasons. Some people say, well, the Reformation was 500 years ago. Why do you guys keep going back? Why go back to the Galatians? That battle has been won. Well, first of all, listen, this false gospel of, of Jesus plus something we do, uh, that is still peddled. <laughs> it's still peddled in all kinds of ways. Some of them in very deliberate and, and, and spoken, written ways. In other words, there are religious traditions to this very day in the broader uh, scope of what we might call Christianity, though it is not the gospel, who still require sacraments and other doings by you before you could ever be assured that you're safe, forgiven, and going to heaven. And those are the official forms. And then there are all these other forms of just, of just the way people think because grace is so foreign to us. The idea that it would be that free is foreign to our, to our humanity. And this Jesus plus message also makes good sense to the broader culture as well because most people in our culture think that religion and Christianity in particular is really or primarily about ethics. It's about conduct. It's about do's and don'ts. Why? Oh, well, on one level, because some of us are getting the gospel wrong, and secondly, because our interaction with the culture is all about ethics. The culture wars. It's confusing people that this is the message. That's not the message, you see. That is not the gospel. And so they expect to hear Jesus plus something from us, you see. And so it's important to keep the gospel clear. The gospel of, that, that Paul has preached, the gospel that Christ revealed to him, is all of Christ, not some of Christ and some of me. <laughs> because that is no gospel at all. How much of me? Who gets to decide how much of me? How do I measure how much of me? How much of me today? How much of me tomorrow, you see? And we lose all assurance. The, God, the, the apostle John says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. 
And the only way you can know you have eternal life is because that's the promise of the Father, that the, what Christ has done is sufficient. It's not Jesus plus some of me. And so it's very important, you see, in this era of culture wars in our country, that we be clear about the gospel, what it is, and distinguish between the gospel that saves and ethics, morals. This book, I think, will help us do that, right? It will help us understand that, give us greater clarity about the gospel. Christ alone saves. And the only prerequisite for salvation, Paul will argue, is the quality, if we're looking at human qualities, is the quality that Abraham possessed, which was what? Faith. Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And Paul will argue, we are sons of Abraham by faith. Faith alone, which itself, Paul tells us elsewhere, is also the gift of God. We must be clear about the gospel. And we must not capitulate to modern Judaizers. The Jesus plus anything gospel is no gospel at all. Whatever color or shape or stripe it comes in. You know, if we are to measure ourselves by the law of God, and that's what Paul says here. He says, you want to you keep the law? Well, then let's, go, then let's go all the way and keep the law. <laughs> and if we are to measure ourselves just by the Ten Commandments, and Paul's talking about more, if we are to measure ourselves by just the Ten Commandments, and we are told that God demands perfection, and we are told that we are to keep those with all our heart, with all our soul, all our strength, none of us, no one, has any chance of being reconciled to God. You understand that? But the gospel declares that on the doings of Jesus alone, by your faith in him, you can be assured that you are justified before God and that you are forgiven. And when you die, you will enter into his blessed presence. Amen? You see, it's that clear. It needs to be that clear. Are there ethics in the Christian life? Absolutely. Is there a right way to follow Christ? Absolutely. All of that comes after. Every bit of it. I think the hymn uh, written by Augustus Lady, Top Lady, which I think many of you will know, Rock of Ages, captures that so beautifully. Listen to these two verses in light of everything I've said so far. He says, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. <laughs> thou must save, and what? Thou alone. And then he says, nothing, nothing in my hand I bring Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, lest I die. That's the gospel, beloved. Why study Galatians? Because... The Jesus Plus message is constantly being peddled by the enemy in different shapes and different forms. And secondly, I want to point out that Galatians was written not only to counter the false gospel of legalism, the false gospel of Jesus plus my doings, but it was also written to these Christian churches which Paul planted in order to enforce and strengthen the centrality of God's grace in their life. The centrality of grace in, the, in, in, in Christian fellowship, in the church relationships. That's another a reason this book was written. Galatians was written to the church for the health of the church. And why is that? Because as I've already alluded to, even we Christians, 
even we Christians, I think every one of us, if we're going to be honest, will admit this, even we Christians tend to import some of our own doings in order to feel good about our relationship with God. <laughs> in order maybe even to be assured that I'm in Christ or uh, to find some joy and comfort uh, that I've lost through struggling with sin or something like that. And when we do that, eventually it may make you feel good for that moment because you're the one that, that created the level and then you met it. <laughs> but if you keep doing that, you're going to find out that you're, you're going to actually lose your joy, lose your peace because it's resting upon your doings, not his, you see. And peace and joy and comfort comes from living under the gospel, understanding his doings. That's our duty when we come here on the Lord's Day. We come on the Lord's Day, wherever we are in a book, in this book, wherever we may find ourselves, we come here and we come here repeatedly to hear God's word and to see its relationship to the finished work of Jesus Christ to hear the gospel, to participate in the visual gospel as today in the Lord's Supper, to commune with him and to be reassured that his doings are enough, that all is well between God and us because of Christ. Tony Merida in his commentary says, even after we are saved, saved by grace, there are still traces of a performance mentality that we all struggle with. <laughs> we think we can earn God's favor by what we do. We remain, says Philip Riken, he says, we remain legalists by nature. <laughs> In other words, this is our default. Our default is to go back to our doings. Right? And that's why Galatians has been called this by more than one author, a book for recovering Pharisees. <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> and that's me. A book for recovering Pharisees. Why? Because our default condition, even as Christians, because we still have that connection to sin in us, right? The flesh, as Paul refers to it, that influence that stems down from, from Adam in all of us. Even as Christians, uh, that default is our default conditions. And it is to return to a way of thinking that says, God doesn't love me unless I do this well. Unless I accomplish this Unless I read this much, unless I pray that hard, unless I give this much, unless I do this or that for him, I won't be assured of his love, you know. If I am to stay in God's good graces, I, and he is to hear my prayers today, and he is to love me, then I have to do better. I know I struggled with this early on in my walk for years, beloved. And I placed this very same yoke upon other people, even as I entered ministry in 1990 to 90, 1993. And one month before I went into seminary, for that full month, I went down and I, I was there alone while my family stayed in, up here in Northern California. And for that one month, I meditated on Psalm 119, memorizing as much as I could of it. I read through the book of Ephesians over and over, and I, and I read uh, Jerry Bridges' book, The Discipline of Grace, until it all broke through. And I literally lay on my bed all alone, weeping like a baby. Not weeping as much, so much because of my failures and the yoke that I had on, put on others at that point, <clears throat> but weeping because I felt that yoke which I had put back on myself, taken back by Christ. <laughs> who said, enough of this. I kept the law. I kept the law for you. Your sins have always been forgiven. I have always loved you. The Father loves you. Not on any merit. Yes, and there I came across that famous line of, uh, of Jerry Bridges. Your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace and your best days are never so good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. <laughs> In other words, all my relating to God and God's relating to me is always on the basis of his doings, Christ's doings, not mine. Yes, and 
It was a floodgate for me. It changed everything. I gave Sherry the book. I talked to her. I confessed to people. I went back and looked for people who in ministry I thought I had burdened uh, by putting a pressure on them that was putting chains. Every day, God relates to you and me through the prism of what? The prism of his son and his finished work. Relish it. Thank him for it. Our hearts should be characterized by gratitude and joy. And, and when you and I stumble, because we will stumble, we go to our loving Heavenly Father and thank him again for the gift of his son and seek strength to live another day. And no, you are always welcome. His arms are open wide. He would be denying the work of his son if he didn't receive you. And not understanding this, you see, not understanding the gospel and living under that reality impacts not only our own sense of joy and peace, but this is why it's important for our church as well. It impacts how we view others. It impacts our relationships with others in the church. You see, uh, when we tend to justify ourselves before God by our doings, by our list, you know, by the things, the things that we do well, and that's usually what our list consists of, right? Stuff we do well. <laughs> And so when we justify ourselves before God in ways like that, we look down at others who don't seem to be living up to the standard that I am living up to. We become self-righteous, legalist Christians. And that was happening to the church at Galatia. If they were now going to perfect themselves by the law, this was going to lead to trouble. I'm sure Paul already heard about it. That's why he says in uh, verse 15 of chapter 5, listen, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not going to be consumed by one another. Because that's what list people do. They bite and devour one another. And so he says at verse 26, the end of chapter 5, let us not become conceited, provoking one another. And envying one another. When you walk by the flesh, he says, these things happen. When you walk by the Spirit, love, joy, peace, self-control. Those are the things that we'll experience. So yes, this is going to be very important. This was such a powerful, it's such a powerful, um, how do I put it, natural default condition that even Peter, who stood up in Acts 15 and says, how could we put this yoke on others? Even Peter and Barnabas were taken captive by the Judaizers. And Paul says that in chapter 2, verse 11. Paul says, I'd have, uh, if verse 11 here, when Cephas, that's Peter's Hebrew name, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Wow. <laughs> because he stood condemned. Wow. <laughs> Why? For be before certain men came from James, from Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles. Oh, he was loving that barbecue pork. <laughs> oh, they were having a blast. But when, but when they came, when, when those Jews came, he drew back. He drew back and separated himself. He's looking down now, uh, fearing the circumcision party. I'm with them. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy, he says. Wow. But when I saw, listen to this, when I saw that their conduct, and here's the goal of our conduct, it was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That's it. And that's our goal, that our lives together, our relationships, our conduct would be what? In step with the truth of the gospel. He said, when I saw that their conduct was not instead of in step with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas before them all, this is what? Public rebuke. Peter, let's have a gathering. Everyone's there, and he says, Peter, I'd like to address you. <laughs> he says, I, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, oh yeah, you did, <laughs> and not like a Jew, how can you force these Gentiles to live like Jews? You see. And so this is essential for the church, for the church's well-being. We live under the reality of the gospel that the cross is sufficient. And uh, Look, it usually begins something like this. 
we begin to think, well, the Bible does say we should read our Bible, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Bible does say uh, that we should pray, right? Oh, oh, yeah. And the Bible does say that Jesus prayed, and he withdrew a whole night to pray. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Bible says we should hide the word in our, yeah, we should memorize the Bible, you know. The Bible says we should do this, we should do that, we should give this, we should give that. You know what? I'm good at this one, this one, and this one. You know what? We should all be good at this one, this one, and this one. Why isn't he good at this one, this one, and this one? Why isn't she good at this one, this one, and this one? How could God be pleased with her if she's not good with this and this and this? In fact, you know what? I'm not pleased with her <laughs> that she's not good with this. I'm on God's side. Oh, I exaggerate it. But that's what resides in our hearts, isn't it? It's dangerous. What happens is we marginalize. This is our human nature. Just accept this now. <laughs> we marginalize and minimize our own sins, our own struggles. We put them aside and we magnify the struggles of others. We magnify the things that we're good at and hold them up, hold others up to that standard. There's a book I go back to once in a while when I'm thinking about this, because I'm not immune. It's a book called Accidental Pharisees. Oops. <laughs> I'm a Pharisee again. <laughs> it's a book by Pastor Larry Osborne. I'm going to quote what he says there. It's a long quote, but I'll finish with this. We'll be done. He says, Pharisees love a litmus test. Always have, always will. <laughs> In the days of Jesus, their rigid rules and extra-biblical standards gave them a quick and easy way to distinguish between the godly and the ungodly, the committed and the uncommitted. It allowed them to know who was in and who was out. He goes on to say, 2,000 years later, not much has changed. <laughs> Those of us who want to be numbered among the highly committed still hate the idea of being average and ordinary. It scares us to death. <laughs> and we assume that God's favor is reserved for the most dedicated. We can't imagine a kingdom of God with room for stragglers, strugglers, doubters, or the weak. And so we've created a new set of litmus tests and boundary markers to show that we're still at the front of the line here. <laughs> he says, I've grown increasingly concerned about the proliferation of new boundary markers and litmus tests. I regularly have people ask me if our church is missional, gospel-centered, spirit-led, expositional, externally focused, and a variety of other terms. He says, no one asks me if we love Jesus. That's too generic. <laughs> They want to know if I pass their particular litmus test. They want to know if I share their vision, their agenda, and code words. And if I do, I get the secret handshake, you know. <laughs> and if not, they'll pray for me. He finishes and says, all of these, now listen, you heard some things in there that are important, right, in that list. He says, all of these expressions of the Christian faith are trying to emphasize something good, right? God-centered, Christ-centered, expositional. They all have an important place in the kingdom, but they've all, they're all teetering on the edge of a dangerous cliff. That's because the moment we allow our personal passion, our calling to become the litmus test for everyone, he says by which we decide who is in and who is not, and who is and who isn't a genuine disciple, he says, we've taken a step too far. At that point, we're no longer building the kingdom. We've started to tear it down. Remember Bonhoeffer's quote. Those of you who've been here some years, you remember Bonhoeffer from his book, Life Together. He says, he who loves his dream of a community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. Even though his personal intentions may be ever so honest and earnest and sacrificial. But God hates visionary dreaming because it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. <laughs> 
the man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. <laughs> he enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his own law, and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of the brethren. Yeah, when we love our dream of what the church should be rather than what it is, <laughs> scars and all, <laughs> the weak, the struggling, the doubting, the, the ones with questions, then we have now begun to destroy the actual church, the actual fellowship we have. This will be a great study, I think. I'm praying for it, and I pray that you will also pray for it, that you will keep your mind on the things uh, that I've shared this morning, um, that you learn to ask yourself, how am I relating to God? How am I viewing others? Do I have the peace and joy of resting in Christ? or Am I living by lists, and that list is the things I'm good at? And then looking at others who aren't so good at their list. Yeah, this will be a great study. So now we come to the table, which rejoices in what? In what is central to Paul. Here's how he began. Grace to you. This is what that table is saying to you. Grace to you and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God, our God and Father. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll be led into the table. Oh, God, I pray you would... Just soak us, baste us, drench us in the gospel and your grace through this study. Heal hearts that are broken and hurt and those who lack assurance and joy, those who think they're not doing enough. Help us to live with one another as well under the glory of the gospel that we might not bite and devour each other but be, Lord, messengers of God's grace and peace to one another. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.